Vale. <risa> Carl Sagan is here. You know him as a distinguished astronomer. His program on public television, Cosmos, was one of the most watched public television programs ever. Perhaps, I don't have the numbers here, perhaps Civil War uh, had more viewers in attendance, but Cosmos was a terrific series and got a lot of attention for Carl Sagan. He has a new book, which is called Pale Blue Dot. It is a vision of the human future in space, and that is our subject this evening. I want to turn to this picture and to get some sense of what a pale blue dot means. This is taken from, Carl, welcome to the broadcast. <laughs> no worries, this is taken from Voyager 2, is it? Uh, uh, Voyager 1, actually. Voyager 1. But take a look at this, and you can see here what? What's the meaning of this? Well, here's this spacecraft that has flown by the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and right. Neptune system. Right. Is on its way, astonishingly, to the stars, a triumph yeah. of human engineering. We turn the cameras back and take a photograph of the planet from where it came. Yeah. And we can barely see it. Here it is, a fragile, delicate, pale blue dot. And that's where we live. That's where every human has ever lived. And you can see the vulnerability at a glance. And that gives a uh, humbling and, uh, I think, character-building sense of... Uh, of where we are. Humbling because it says that we're only one small portion of something that is enormously large? Absolutely. And let me say a word about what that, what that is. This dot is one of uh, nine planets that goes around a humdrum star that lives at the outskirts of a perfectly ordinary galaxy, which is composed of 400 billion other stars in a universe of maybe a hundred billion galaxies yeah. and recent thoughts suggest this universe one of a very large number perhaps an infinite number of other closed off universes yeah. in that context what is the chance that we are the center or the point of the universe to you no chance to me no chance at all you also believe, I'm getting ahead of myself here, you believe that we may very well, because of, the, because of what we will be able to do, that we may be able to, in a sense, inhabit other places because of technologies that will be able to, uh, to inject onto those places certain qualities that are necessary for the survival of life. Mm -hmm. Of human life. Right. Yeah, the technology, it's a double-edged sword and uh, its powers are absolutely extraordinary and the rate of increase of those powers is dazzling and uh, not tomorrow not in the next few decades but on the time scale of centuries the possibility of altering the environment of an entire world so humans could live there fairly comfortably without heroic life support equipment seems to be really possible and long before that we can visit and we can establish base camps. Yeah. You have always been, if I'm correct, and I think a strong proponent of manned exploration. Not really. It's, uh, I've had a very conflicted uh, sense of it. Uh, maybe I can say okay. why. It's been advertised as essential for science, but it's not. Robots can do it at 10 percent the cost and you don't risk human lives. And the, the standard set of justifications for human spaceflight, uh, I have found wanting. But in Pale Blue Dot, I've come to a, uh, to a different opinion, that all of my objections are short-term objections, that in the long term, it is important for us humans to be out there. And the reasons are, uh, I can quickly say what they are. First is, we are an exploratory species. The last 10,000 years, we've, we've been sitting around in civilization. Before that, for the last few hundred thousand years, we were wanderers, explorers, nomads, and that is in our blood. And spaceflight is an opportunity, the only one open to us, to continue that long human tradition. Secondly, we, uh, that technology I was talking about can pose a danger to ourselves. We inhabit a very thin protective atmosphere 
our technology can destroy that environment that protects us. I don't for a moment say that the Earth is a disposable planet. We have to make the most heroic efforts to, to preserve it and us. But I still think it would be a good insurance policy, hedging our bets, or as Republicans like to say, uh, diversifying our portfolios for there to be humans on other worlds as well as here. And finally, there's a specific identifiable hazard that, uh, again, not in 10 years, but in hundreds or thousands starts to become worrisome. And that is that the Earth will be hit by a, uh, a large asteroid or comet. And if we're ever going to deal with that, we have to be in space. Put all that together, you and I see on a time scale of decades to centuries, we really have to have a significant presence in space. Is there today, are, are you in, were you in, you weren't in favor of the space shuttle? Space shuttle puts five, six, seven people into a tin can, shoots it up 200 miles, and they launch a communication satellite that um, could have been launched by an unmanned booster, and then the, the newts reproduce nicely, or the tomato plants don't grow, and then they come down again, and NASA called that exploration. That's not exploration. Yeah, but is it possible, and I'm, I'm way hell out of my leg here, but, <laughs> but is it possible that they learn things from that that would enable them to do the other things that are much more important. It's a, you're not out of your league at all. It's an excellent question. If we were into long duration spaceflight, spaceflight of about a year or something yeah. like that, as the Russian program has been, then yes, you could say we're, we're learning how to go These to the These are the planets. building blocks to go somewhere else. But if we just go up for a week, we learn nothing about that. And uh, this is one of many reasons, by the way, why a joint multinational exploratory program involving Russians and Americans and Europeans and Japanese would make a whole lot of sense. Every one of these nations has capabilities that the other doesn't. How about a space station? Again, what's it for? The standard explanations uh, make money, make products that you can't manufacture down here on Earth competitively. How about medicines and other kinds medicines. of benefits? There's not a single one of those justifications that stands up to close scrutiny. The, the critical question is, if you were to spend the same amount of money that you're proposing to spend up there, down here, could you produce a competitive or superior product? And the answer always is yes. But if our objective is to prepare for long-term human exploration in space, then space station could start. Did we learn sense. anything from Apollo other than the fact that we can get there and perhaps that told us something about exploration of other planets? Apollo was about the nuclear arms race and beat the Russians and intimidating the other nations. That's what Apollo National was pride. about. National pride. National pride, if you wish, but mainly using rocket prowess, yeah. demonstrating we had it. But as a subsidiary, as an accidental byproduct and advantage, there's that whole gorgeous series of exploratory missions. The Mariners, the Voyagers, the Vikings, Galileo, and on the Russian side, likewise, which have just flocked through the solar system. And so what have we learned from those? I mean, I'm now switching to the other side. First part of the book, you talk about, in a sense, some sense of, of our place in the universe. And then you also talk about what have we learned in the last 30 years from, from all from the Vikings and the Voyagers and right. all of that. Right. What have we learned? This is the first moment in the entire history of the human species when we've explored firsthand, I mean, uh, uh, not, not, not humans, but our machines, our robots, sending back the data, the environment we live in. We have examined every planet from Mercury out to Neptune. We have examined 70 moons and some comets and some asteroids. Never before has that been done. There's only one first time. That's our generation. But what, uh, but what has it taught us? It's taught us, you take a look at Venus, yeah. you see a world with a surface temperature of 900 degrees Fahrenheit produced by a massive carbon dioxide greenhouse effect. And never again will you be tempted to believe a radio talk show hosts who say that the greenhouse effect is uh, something invented Somebody's by the imagination is not a danger. By liberals. You look at Mars and you see a planet without an ozone layer in which ultraviolet light from the sun has in effect fried the surface so that even organic molecules cannot survive there. And never again will you say that there's no danger to the depleting in the ozone our ozone. Right. We learn about our world by exa examining other worlds. 
Is there any commitment in terms of the national will now, reflected among the public, which has to support this kind of thing? Is there any enthusiasm for exploration? The key question is exploration. When the poles are put in terms of real exploration, not driving a truck 200 miles up, but right. going to some new places, the support is overwhelmingly positive, much stronger than it was in 1969. But I don't hear politicians talking about it. I don't hear don't. any part of a great debate. I mean, here we are about to launch, over the next couple of years, a great debate about the role of government. Clearly, exploration is something that has to be done, I assume. You see, by government. What we're talking, it, it has to, it's too expensive yeah, exactly. to do by private industry or wealthy individuals. What we're talking about, the advantages that accrue are largely long-term advantages. And here... Long-term meaning over the next meaning 100 over years, 200 years? No, even ju ju just uh, decades. Right. And here, as in many other areas of our society, we have this fatal conflict between the short-term and the long-term. And it's always so tempting to say, let the long-term take care of itself. I get re-elected on the basis of what I do in the short term. And that is extremely dangerous. It's very important, of course, to plan things in the short term. But we have to have a mix. Every great society does that. What's been the single most exhilarating moment in the exploration process for you? Oh, goodness, there have been so many. But one, it have been one or two moments in which you said, you know, uh, my when heart pounded faster <laughs> than it ever had. I, I mean, the moment I, I, I must say, it. every time we go to a new world, yeah. my heart pounds. But uh, the Viking, when for the first time we set down on Mars where no one had ever been before and took pictures of this landscape that didn't look the least bit exotic. It looked like uh, mm. Arizona or, or Utah. Uh, that said to me something about the commonality of processes about other worlds having something, some similarity to our own. Another one is Titan, the big moon of, of Saturn, where the stuff of life, organic matter, is raining down from the skies like manna from heaven. Want to know about where we came from, where life on Earth came from? Go to Titan. The early steps are happening right now. And then the idea of the Voyager spacecraft achieving escape velocity from the sun on their way to wander forever among the stars. Let me t turn, I got, I'm losing time. I got to want to turn to a couple of things. One, it is that uh, you were a strong, you were a very strong part of the movement against nuclear weapons, number one. Yes. You were very strong in your opposition to Star Wars. Yes. There is now, you begin to hear in the political community, some notion, well, maybe Star Wars is possible. I mean, uh, not Star Wars, but maybe SDI defense. is possible. Well, I mean, basically what people are now worried about are not 10,000 Soviet warheads, but 10 One terrorist Iranian with, right, warheads right. or something like that. But if the United States had the ability to shoot down 10 warheads and some other country wished to blow up a nuclear weapon in the United States, then you don't send it by missile. You send it by ship or in the embassy pouch. Mm -hmm. This doesn't solve the problem. And what's more, it tells that country, build more than 10 weapons. Uh, my other last point here, because i got to get out of here, is the notion you have always believed there is life in another place. Because it would be an ultimate conceit of ours to think that we were the only place where there was enough intelligence to... B belief is strong, but I would say... What's, I what's would say what it are you characterizing? A, it is such an important question. We have the ability to find out the answers, send spacecraft to nearby worlds, use radio telescopes to see if anyone's sending us yeah. a message from a planet of another star. I'd be ashamed of my civilization if we had the tools to find out the answers and refuse to look. And if we didn't at least open ourselves to the idea. Absolutely. Possible. Carl Sagan's book is A Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Charlie. Thank Good you to very see you. much. Thank you for joining us this evening on my birthday. Happy uh, birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Bill said you'd sing, so, but I, Happy I'll Happy birthday yeah. <laughs> to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Pleasure to have you. Thanks. Thank you. We thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. See you then. Among others, John Singleton will be here, uh, the film maker. See you then. <laughs>